I'm here because I am a roaring lion crying out righteousness. What I'd like to be able to do today is to continue to go over the looking at that Allah is a kingdom of, of heaven and, uh, and, and then exploring the, the matter of our being uh, chosen by God or others being, um, if you will, uh, called by God. And the ultimate aspect or the ultimate of the teachings of Jesus, first of all, let me just do this. Uh, the Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 22, um, states at the pretty much midway the tribulation that most flesh on planet Earth will be destroyed. Now, this is Jesus prophesying. This is not John, Peter, or Paul, or Elijah, Jeremiah, one of them. This is Jesus prophesying. And as we have learned recently that Jesus came through the first group of slaves, the slaves that were, the Jews that were slaves for 400 years, is the, the, the community that he chose or that God chose to manifest Jesus. The, the, the first group of slaves that were slaves in Egypt is the group that it was prophesied, both the slavery and that Jesus would manifest himself through a group of slaves. They're called Jews. And they're the sons of Shem, their oldest father, and the son of um, of Israel, if you will, their father going into Egypt and their father crossing the Red Sea and the Jordan River. What I want to state here is that Jesus prophesied that the flesh, all flesh on planet Earth would be destroyed except for a group called the elect. And this is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 22. And it's in the middle, by the way, of the pro prophecy of the Lord Jesus Christ. Seven verses later, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 29, Jesus himself makes his appearance on planet Earth. So that we want to look at in terms of understanding the prophecy of Atla, understanding the call of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, for those that are called and the chosen of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there are some that are called in Matthew's gospel, chapter 22, verse 14. There are some that are called of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there are just a few that are chosen of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's just back up for one moment. I want the engineer to bring up 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, Mr. Engineer, if you could bring that up. Because I want to show you a New Testament reference to the first pope. Well, I shouldn't call him a pope. But the first leader of the group that Jesus washed in his blood, his name was Peter, Simon Peter, uh, Simon Barjona. And Jesus gave him the power to bind on earth. And what, he, what Peter said on earth, heaven would recognize and, and, and co-sign. And whatever he would lose on earth, heaven would recognize and cosign. But Peter made a statement, and I want to read it from the Old Testament, then I'm going to Psalms chapter 90, verse 4. Uh, Mr. Engineer, if you could bring that up, first Peter chapter, second Peter rather, chapter 3, verse 8, where Peter outlines the the scope of eternity that but, but Peter used that term, beloved. Uh, be not ignorant of, Reverend Brooks used to use that all the time. Reverend, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day as with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So we understand, as you and I have been listening recently, that the... Uh, a thousand years that nobody has ever lived a full day since the day since Adam and Eve sinned. Methuselah lived 969 years, but in the essence of all things, that wasn't even a completion of a day. The second person that lived the longest was 
um, Noah, who lived 960 years, uh, but even that did not complete a thousand years. So uh, effectively, essentially, and just theologically talking, it doesn't necessarily have to have a lot of spirituality to it, but we're going to get back to the chosen of the Lord and the called of the Lord and the elect of the Lord. But a thousand years is no one has ever lived a thousand years since Adam and Eve. Uh, but Jesus is coming, and when he comes back, he's going to spend 1,000 years on planet Earth, and he's going to spend that 1,000 years in Atla. And that's what I'm doing. I'm getting it ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm working hand in hand with the Holy Ghost, who is wrapping up his work, getting ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus will spend 1,000 years here, and there'll be 1,000 years of peace on Earth because the devil will be bound a thousand years. There's probably a lot of questions that one would raise, and we'll understand them better by and by. But the Bible tells us that Satan, that devil, that dragon, will be bound with a chain from an angel out of heaven, and he'll be placed in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. That's in Revelation. Mr. Engineer, bring up Revelation chapter 20. Um that Satan will be bound for 1,000 years. Now, when it comes to the time measurement, 1,000 years has become the most definitive way of understanding a day with the Lord is as 1,000 years, and 1,000 years is as one day. But here is what's going to happen to the chosen of God, chosen to be the elect. And as we have stated in many of our statements going preceding these statements, um, is that uh, many people are called and are baptized and are full of the Holy Ghost, but they've not been chosen. And many of them will be a part of the second resurrection, and we'll get to that also. But what I want to express here now is that there'll be one day of peace on planet Earth before the new heaven and the new Earth. And we'll understand better how to, why that's going to take place. But in, in Revelation chapter 20, the Bible says that John said, I saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of a bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. So that's, that again is the one day analogy. It's a thousand years. It's a thousand times 365 days to be sure and 24 hours in each one of those days. There's no doubt about that. However, in the scope of eternity, if there was a glimpse of what eternity looked like, one day, well, 1,000 years would be as one day. And we're talking about 1,000 times 365 days, 24 hours in each one of those days. But in the scope of eternity, 1,000 of those 365 days would, would be nebulous or meaningless in terms of Eternity, except you just can't measure it. However, Satan will be bound for 1,000 years. And he'll be cast in the bottom of his pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him. And he should not deceive the nations no more till 1,000 years should be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. Now, the thing of it is here is that once Satan is bound, there'll be no more sin. Satan... Satan has tons of sickness, diseases. Satan has tons of hatred. Satan has tons of evil, disobedience. He got all of that in his tail. He got all that in his coat pocket. Satan has all of that in his coat pocket. But once he is bound for a thousand years, including all the things in his tail and his coat pocket, there'll be no more strife. There'll be no more sickness. All of that will be done away with. All of that for a thousand years, there'll be absolute peace on planet Earth for 1,000 years. For 1,000 years, there'll be peace, and that references one day. Now, the people that are chosen to, to reign and to rule and to live with Jesus for 1,000 years on planet Earth are the people I want to focus on uh, in the teaching here now. Thank you, Mr. Engineer. So what we are expressing here 
is that the elect have been chosen by God to not taste of death. They have been chosen to not taste of death. They have been chosen. And now that some of you may remember from some of the teachings uh, years ago in the church that Israel, were the cho- they were the chosen people. And that Israel proper, the geography, the land, was a chosen land. Atla is the chosen land, and the Hamites are the chosen people for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have expressed that. We've explained that. Now, whether or not it's been believed by most of you, you probably can't believe it if you have not been chosen. You probably cannot believe that Atla is the chosen land the way Israel was the chosen land. You probably cannot believe that if you have not been chosen. As Jesus said in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13, verse 11, It has not been given to you to know that Atla is the chosen land. It has been given to you. But he said, however, to his disciples, it's been given to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to those people there, they'll never know. They have ears, but they can't hear. You know this scripture is true. They have ears, but they can't hear. They have eyes, but they they can't know. And the reason why they don't know is because they haven't been chosen to know. To, To know that Atla... To know that Atla is a chosen land, you have to be chosen and privileged. You can't know that by going to the seminary or to the university or to the law school or to the medical school. And as a result of having that schooling, you would know. You have to be chosen to know. And that's the difference between the call and the chosen. And so in order for us to understand, and I gave several examples, and I'm going to go over those examples over the next several teachings that we're going to do. I gave several examples how only three disciples were chosen to go up on the mount in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, to meet with Moses and Elijah and to hear Almighty God speak affirmingly about Jesus. Only three, the nine were not chosen, and not only that, but the three that were chosen were told not to tell the nine that were not chosen. This will, we will understand this better in the course of where we are in terms of understanding our lot as chosen, our, our lot as the called of God. And then there is, of course, the statement by Jesus in Matthew's, Luke, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 22, verse 14, that says, many are called, but that few of them, few of the, even just a, a few of them. So Allah is the call. And the reason why people can't understand Atla is because it has not been given to them to understand it. It hasn't been given. And it doesn't mean that they can ever learn it. it if they've not been chosen, if they've not been chosen, like the nine disciples that did not go up on the mount to meet with Moses and Elijah and Almighty God affirming Jesus, They didn't have that experience, and not only did they not have that experience, but it was forbidden that they would learn it. Jesus told his disciples, don't tell them. So there are people that Almighty God has forbidden to know about Atla. Mr. Engineer, bring me to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, starting at verse 1. So to be chosen, we have an ultimate responsibility We have an ultimate responsibility of preparing a place for the Lord Jesus Christ to return to. But the call, and the the call will be a part of the second resurrection, and I'm going to get to that uh, in Revelation chapter 20 and Revelation chapter 21 with the new heaven and the new earth. Trust me, let, let me work my way through the process of helping you understand the called and the chosen. But there are many people who... You can call them Christians if that satisfies your spiritual identity. But God has forbidden them to know about Atla. You say, Pastor man, that doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. They will know about it in the grave, but they will not know about it now. They will know about it at the resurrection. They will know those who are not called, those who are called but not chosen, 
we cannot know about it. It's forbidden that even though they have the Holy Ghost, it is forbidden for them to know. You say, Pastor Manning, what are you talking about? Well, let me, let me, let me put it to you this way. This engineer bring up Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17. I want to show you something. And after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart. And he was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. Then Peter answered and said unto him, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make here three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And while he yet spake, so now here, let's distinguish here. He only took three. I, I don't know if you can find any other place in scripture, and I'd have to check my, my scripture's um, background, but I don't know if you can find any other place in scripture where Jesus only took a portion of his disciples anywhere that he went. He didn't take them all. He just took a portion. I don't know. Then there possibly could be. Now, this is, uh, you know, I, I do know the Bible. I've studied it. I've read it from cover to cover for many years. Um, but I don't know if there's another place, and there very well may be. But I don't know if the, the gospel writers tell us or the apostles tell us of any time that Jesus took a small group and left a larger group of disciples, not just people that are following him. I don't know if the Bible indicates that, if the gospel writers have told us that. But this one time he did it. This is one time he clearly left the nine behind. Now, here's what I want you to do. Let's, let's do some logical, if you will, deductions here. Let's say that the, 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 the whole 12 group had been called by Jesus, and they had been called. All of them had been called by Jesus. The entire 12 group were called, all right? Let's get that established as a call. By call, that means that Jesus picked them out. He handpicked them himself. Let's get that established, right? That that group was called. The entire group, the entire 12 people or disciples or men were called. Is that right? All 12 of them were called. Now, so now we got the 12, so we got the call. But then Almighty God wants to send Moses and Elijah to talk with Jesus and to talk with a special group of the call. So then Jesus chooses three out of the call. So the 12, Peter, James, and John, his brother, they are called, but now they get what? They get chosen for a very special assignment. Are you following me so far? Are you following me so far? So, again, not to be terribly redundant, but to, to, but to be effective. All 12 disciples were personally called by Jesus. All right? We got that right. Like there are many Christians that are personally called by Jesus. They're called by him. They're called by him full of the Holy Ghost. They're called by him. They are called by him. Now, what we're pointing out now is that there are many people who can't understand art law and the kingdom, as the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. And even if they studied, they still couldn't understand it because they have not been chosen. All right. Well, I'm coming back to that. I wanted to remind you why we're here up on the mountain. now. So we're up on the mountain. Appears Moses and Elijah and God speaks from the cloud. Jesus face shines like the sun. We're up on the mountain. Right. The night, the call is still down in the valley. Now, in a teaching further, I'm going to show you that at some point, many people that are called in this era, dispensation over the past 2000 years, past 5000 years, will lay in a grave, either in a place called paradise or purga purgatory or the altar, will lay in that grave for a, a thousand years or more and then at the resurrection or the second coming of Jesus, the call will be raised to sit with the chosen. Now, I know this is theologically, but I, I, you can understand it. You, you, even if you're not chosen, you can understand this. So we have established by logical deduction and, and by scriptural authorization that only three were chosen to go up on the mountain. Only three. 
The nine were not, while all 12 were called, only three were chosen. All right. So many are called, many are called, but few are chosen. And if you don't understand Allah, if you're not committed fully to Allah, it's because you don't understand it. It's because you, you haven't been chosen. There is no way that there's no way you can be committed if you under, if if you would not be committed if you under, if you were chosen. There, the, 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 you can't at one point your 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 position cannot be I'm chosen but I'm not committed. That that doesn't happen, and and God doesn't fool around like that. So you might want to check yourself. But here here's 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 what happens. So we know the 12 were called. Now we see emphatically in Jesus himself for a very special assignment to meet with Moses and Elijah. Listen, these disciples had heard about Moses and Elijah like everybody knows about Moses. Everybody knows about Moses. Even the Hindus know about Everybody knows about Moses. Everybody. And to meet him, to have that special assignment, to spend some time with Moses. I mean, it's like to go back in time to time travel. Go back in time and meet with Moses and Elijah. I mean, to do that, what a privilege. But not everybody was chosen for that. Though they were called, Jesus called all 12 of those disciples, but only three of them were chosen for that great event. There are only a few people that are chosen for Atma, which is the kingdom of heaven on earth. There are only a few people that are chosen. And if you haven't been chosen, you can't be chosen. Well, you can't understand it, I should say. So let me let me share with you that even I think it was Deborah Carter Love that asked the question, well, what about the person that the Holy Ghost? Will they know the Holy Ghost will not tell you that he will he will know, but he will not tell you. So what I want to show you now is that the chosen is such a privileged class of God's people that the disciples that were chosen were instructed not to tell, just like the Holy Ghost won't tell you, were instructed not to tell the call. Don't tell the nine that were called. Don't tell them what you saw. Don't tell them what you know. Don't tell them the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. Don't tell them. I'll read it. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Uh, if thou wilt, let us build, make three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And behold, a voice out of the clouds, out of the cloud, which said, this is my beloved son uh, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their face and were so afraid. And Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, and be not afraid. And when they had lifted up their eyes, they saw no man save Jesus. So Moses and Elijah took off, and the Lord God Almighty from heaven is no longer speaking, and it's just Jesus there with them now. So now they had an experience. You can call it a, a triple theophany if you want. You can call it that. Or you call it a magnificent occurrence, if you will. There are few people on planet Earth. Now, I have to tell you this, so back up for just a moment. I have to tell you this, that I have met with Elijah. I say, oh, Lord, Pastor Man, first of all, now you're talking about we're called and full of the Holy Ghost, but still not chosen. Now you're talking about we're going to lay in a grave for a thousand years before we actually get a chance to go to, the, to, the, to heaven or to the paradise. Or you, and and now, now you're going to tell me you met with Elijah. Well, this should not be, for many of you, this should not be new verbiage because you've heard me say for the last 20 years that Elijah met with me. And he met with me on the assignment of Atla, and he told me about his assignments, and, and, and to some degree that he was still a bit despondent and ready to go home, ready for all this to be over with. But I've been saying that, so I have met with Elijah <laughs> and I'm not laughing because I'm insincere. 
I'm laughing because as I think about what I'm saying, it's been years that all of this has been coming together. And for those of you who have been following me over the years, know that all of this is as one linear prophecy. That is to say, it's in one straight line and it's one building block upon another. And nothing is contrary to the very beginning of my experiences with you, my experiences with Jesus as a as his prophet, as his teacher, my experiences with Atla. All of it is linear starting at at one point and moving on a straight line towards the conclusion of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ at the place called Atla where he shall sleep in this building that the devil is trying to take away. You know, if you knew, if you were chosen, then you would know that Jesus has chosen this building and Atla as the place for his return. And you would do everything within your power you would do everything within your financial reach. You would do everything within your culture, your spiritual, educational. You would do everything within your ability to make sure that this property is preserved, that it is preserved for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even if you had to sleep outdoors yourself, even if you had to sell your own house so that you could pay to make sure that this house, if you are chosen, that's what you'll do. If you're chosen, that's what you'll do. You will withhold nothing. You will withhold nothing. And certainly, certainly you would not want, certainly it, not, would, it would not cross your mind to give that which is holy to the dogs, to give your property to a neighbor or to a family member or to an asso associate. It would, you would never do anything as fleshly, rotten flesh as that. That stinks. When God's place of preparation is most imminent, you are given that which God has given. You're given that which is holy to the dogs. Your family members, many of them are dogs. Your family members, many of them are dogs. They're not even saved. And you know it. And yet, your heart is there and not with the chosen. So you know you're not chosen. When your heart is, when you say, well, I, listen, you know, blood, blood is sticking in the water, water, whatever it is, and I'm going to give my, I'm going to make sure that I take care of, I'm going to use a portion of what I have now, my money right now, to take care of my no good son, to take care of my no good, I know they ain't no good, I know they ain't going to come to the Lord, but I'm going to make sure that I give a, little, give a little something every week out of what they have. That, that, that means that you've not been chosen. You've been, maybe you've been called but you haven't been chosen. You wouldn't give what that you wouldn't give the Lord's money to the dogs. And these people are dogs. Many of your sons, your daughters, your cousins, your uncles, your aunts, your nephews, your nieces, they're dogs. Don't give that which is holy to if they're not dogs, it could get worse. They're swine. Many of your family members are swine. Many of them. And yet you pinch off a little something every week for them. That's because you're not chosen. It's because you're not chosen. You wouldn't give what's holy. You would not give what's holy to the swine, to the dogs. You wouldn't do that. So let's be clear about what we can be clear about. Because if you believe that Jesus, and this, as I said, from this linear point of view of my preaching the prophecy of Allah, you believe that Jesus has chosen Allah. You believe that he's going to sleep in this house then this is where all your energy, all your efforts, everything that you have, everything that you have is consecrated to the purpose of, um, let, let me share something with you. The, I want to give you two examples. One is, is that the, um, Jesus wanted a deliverer. Jesus he wanted to be able to have Egypt brought out of slavery the way he brought me to bring Hamite people out of slavery. Now, you're talking about sacrifice. You're talking about sacrifice. When Almighty God in his infinite, omnipotent, omniscient power realized in order to save humanity and to call people into the chosen, he had to sacrifice the most precious thing he had. 
Almighty God. He had to sacrifice the most precious thing God had. The most precious thing God had was his son, Jesus. That's the most precious, and he gave that up. He sacrificed the most precious thing he had that I might be washed in that precious blood, that I might be saved, that I might be chosen, and that there might be an outlaw. He gave, he sacrificed the most precious thing that he held back nothing. He held back nothing. He sacrificed. Because he understood the ultimate. Without that great sacrifice, nobody was going to be saved. He had to sacrifice the greatest, most precious thing he had. And that was his son. Now that's the way the chosen thinks. That's the way God thinks. He sacrificed. So when you are still holding on secretively, and not sacrificing, that means you're not chosen. You're not acting in the will of God. When you're still giving to the swines and to the dogs, when you're still giving to the swine and the dogs, you're not sacrificing and you're not in the mode of Almighty God. I know I call this, this preacher's name quite a bit. I'll call it once today and I'll let that be. When, when Minister Honaker called me the other day. He said, you know, I've got 19 acres of land, and I've been thinking about it for some time to give it to the church. Now, I know Minister Honaker has a son. He has grandchildren. He has a beautiful family. He does. You know, he could have given that. He has a son named James. I'm John, rather. And I don't want to get into his family business. And I'll have y'all messing with him and all that kind of giving the man a whole lot of trouble. But he didn't give that land to his, to his son or his grandchildren. He could have. He could have. He could have given that land to his grandchildren. He didn't. He gave it to the children of Atla. He gave it to the, the purpose of Atla. Are you ready to do that? Are you, are you ready to do that? Listen, Jesus realized there would be no salvation unless he sacrificed the most precious thing that he has. So when I stand up in the pulpit, I sit here in this chair, and I say to you, sacrifice the most precious thing that you have. And you say, not me. Don't call for all of that. Let me give you one more. The, the Bible says this, that Abraham and Sarah had no children. And that uh, Abraham and Hagar, Hagar got together and, and, and Ishmael was born, but that wasn't God's plan. That was man's plan. That wasn't God. So it didn't change God's prophecy. So finally, after 100 years of living in, by Abraham and 75 years of living by Sarah, Sarah got pregnant and brought forth her firstborn son named Isaac. And so the Bible says that Isaac was somewhere about 12 years old, 12 to 14 years old. And God came to Abraham one night and said, Abraham, take your son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, not Ishmael, but take Isaac, the one that you love. Get thee up on Mount Moriah and sacrifice him unto me. Good God Almighty. Good God Almighty. Good God Almighty. Now Isaac was the chosen one. Ishmael was probably not even called. But Isaac was the chosen one of God. Abraham 100 years old, Sarah 75. Chosen. Isaac was the chosen one of God. And then God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, I want you to sacrifice my son, your son. Abraham didn't change words. Abraham didn't ask why. Abraham didn't say, it took me all these years to get him. Now you're going to take him away from me just like that. Abraham just said, Isaac, wake up, boy. Isaac's sleeping. Wake up, boy. Wake up. Wake up. 
Where we going, Daddy? We're going up on Mount Moriah to sacrifice. Okay, Isaac put on his sandals and put his shirt on. And, uh, and Abraham got the donkey, got the mule, got the knife. And Isaac followed around like a little boy, following his old man, his, old, his father, now nearly 120 years old, following his father up on the mount. And so they get up on the mount, the Bible says. So Isaac said, Lord, uh, 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 Abraham, father, where's the, sac where's the lamb? Where's the, where's, the, where's the sacrifice? Abraham said to Isaac, God will prepare him. And Abraham took Isaac and put him on the altar. Isaac didn't ask any question. Father, why are you putting me on this altar? Isaac didn't fight. Isaac did not ask any questions. I told you I'm going to give you two examples to let you know whether you're chosen or not. Isaac didn't ask any questions. Abraham put him on the altar, and then Abraham took the knife. And if the Bible says Abraham raised the knife high above his head and was getting ready to slaughter his son, his only son, he's going to sacrifice. He's going to sacrifice his son. He's going to sacrifice his son, I tell you. And an angel cried out from heaven, Abraham. Abraham, do the lad no harm. <laughs> Abraham dropped his knife. Isaac got up off the altar knowing his father was getting ready to sacrifice him. But so when you're chosen, you hold nothing back from God. And the Bible says that um, Abraham heard another sound of a lamb crying in the court, a, a ram caught in the thicket of the bush. His horns were caught in the bush. He was trying to get, ah, blah, 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 blah. The, the ram was trying to get out of the bush. Abraham went over and got the bush and sacrificed the ram. We call that place Jehovah Rapha. But God will provide. So do you want to know whether you're chosen or not? Are you willing to sacrifice everything? Are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to stop giving that which is holy to the dogs or the swine? Now, let me say this to you. You very well may be chosen. You very well may be chosen. But you did not know what I just taught you. Now you're hearing the mysteries and your heart is in agreement. You may not, if you're hearing now the mysteries, as Jesus said in Matthew 13, verse 11, if you're hearing now, you, you may be chosen, but you have been, you have been because you didn't hear, you didn't know I wasn't teaching. It wasn't that I wasn't teaching, but we didn't get to this linear part of the prophecy. And so you were pinching off a little something here and there for these no good stinking dogs you call your family. And they are dogs. And some of them are swine. They stink. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. I said the other day that uh, God allowed Mother Cooper to go ahead of us so we can see how ugly your family member. Boy, that, that woman's family member showed their rear end. I'm surprised they didn't take down their pants and defecate on the floor. That's how ugly they were. But your family members are worse than that. But perhaps, perhaps, perhaps now that you know that it takes the ultimate sacrifice, otherwise there is no promise. There is no blessing. So God gave his, he gave his own. And when I first read that, that in Genesis chapter 18, when I first read that about Abraham and Isaac, I said, my goodness, I said, that's the same thing. Abraham did on that Mount Moriah what God did on Mount Calvary. I said, I was in prison, by the way. I was in jail. It was a jail cell when I read that one night. Uh, Abraham did on Mount Moriah what God did on Mount Calvary. I said, Lord, have mercy. The Bible is right. The Bible is right. I started throwing them Qurans and Muslim books and the Baghdad Gita and all that other stuff. Burn it. Get rid of it. The Bible is right. It's true. It's true, I tell you. Abraham, to be the father 
of the chosen had to sacrifice his own son. <laughs> and by the way, if you sacrifice, if your if your if you sacri if you stop supporting that rotten, stinking flesh of your family members, because they stink, they are dogs. You stop supporting them and start sacrificing unto Almighty God, you will find Jehovah Rapha. You will find a ram in the bush too. Yeah, you will. You won't lose anything by preparing a place for the Lord Jesus Christ. You won't lose a thing. No, you won't. You'll find a ram in the bush and say, well, I'm going to give up everything for the purpose. I'm going to give it all up. I'm going to give it all up for the purpose of Jesus having a place to return to. He ain't, when he come this time, he ain't going to be sleeping in no stable. He's going to be sleeping in the outlaw building on 123rd Street. I give up everything. I'm giving up everything. You, and when you give up, guess what? Get ready because you have to get, the more you give up, the more God gives you to give up. You say, well, Pastor Manny, you said a few moments ago I wasn't chosen. Let me say this to you. Before Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mount, he knew that they were chosen. They didn't know that they were, but he knew that they were. I'll go you one better. When Jesus asked the question, and he didn't ask the question, like any good lawyer, Jesus did not ask a question of his disciples of that he did not know the answer to. When he asked him in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 16, who do men say that I am? Some of them said, John the Baptist, I'll say Jeremiah, I'll say Elijah, John, and Jesus said, but yeah, who do you say I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus knew that Peter, Jesus knew that God was gonna speak to me. He knew that didn't take him by surprise. He was chosen. And even out, of the, even out of the three, Peter was chosen for even greater. He was chosen. And Jesus knew before Peter answered that Peter was chosen. And Jesus knew before he got ready to go up on the Mount of Transfiguration that Peter, James, and John were chosen and the other nine were not. He knew that, but they didn't know it. He knew that, but they didn't know it. And guess who speaks when they get up on that mount? Peter, he's the one that speaks on that mount. Lord, let's build a house for you. But then you didn't bring me back because I, I didn't finish with Matthew 17. Peter says, once he get up on that mount, he sees Moses and Elijah. Guess what he says? Let's build an outlaw on a hundred, building on 123rd Street so that Moses and Elijah will have a place to sleep. They didn't know they were chosen. And maybe some of you didn't know you were chosen. But now that you know, are you ready to sacrifice? Here's what Peter said, and here's what I want you to do. When Peter realized, when God opened his eyes, when God brought him up on that mount, and he was able to see that po the power of Moses and Elijah, he didn't say, oh, I'm going to go around and write a book and become a bestseller, the New York Times bestseller, going to make a lot of money and go buy myself a house in Bel Air, Beverly Hills. That ain't what he said. Oh, I'm going to not take care of my children. I'm going to take care of my nieces, my aunts, my uncle. I'm going to take care of all of them. That ain't what he said. When Peter saw the light, he said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let us make the three tabernacles. Let's make a house for Jesus. I'm telling you that Jesus is going to sleep here in Outlaw and you're going to wheel your property to somebody else? I'm telling you, and you've given your benefits to your stinking dogs and stinking swine? That ain't what Peter said. Peter said, no, let's prepare a place for Jesus. Outlaw is the preparation of a house for Jesus, a place for Jesus, a place where the people shall walk barefoot because the land is holy ground. That's what the chosen will say. That's what the chosen will say. Moses is here. Moses has returned to earth. Well, let's build a house for him. Elijah has turned, returned to earth. Let's give it to my aunts or uncles or nephews or nieces or brothers or sisters or children or whatever, grandchildren. Let's give it to the prophet of God. 
Let's give it to the prophet of God. Let's give it to the prophet of God, not to our stinking flesh. We can make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah. Let's do that. That's what the chosen will say. And will not condemn me when I get up and say to you, don't give that which is holy to the dog. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Stop it now. Stop it now. Stop it now. Stop it now. Stop it. If you're chosen. If you're chosen. And I will state as well that you perhaps or perchance are chosen, but you did not, could not notice until the messenger of God, that's me, came and I'm teaching you. Now that I'm teaching you, now that you know. You say, well, my goodness, Pastor Man, that's Bible. God gave up his only son. We know that, but we never thought about it that way, that in order to save humanity, he, and so that I could be saved, he gave his son. And now you're telling me that Abraham did the same thing? That Abraham, Abraham gave his only son. You know, Abraham loved Isaac. Took him 100 years to get that boy. And now I'm just one. And, and when God asked Abraham as an offer, when God asked Abraham to offer his son as an offering, he didn't change words. Sometimes I get up and I ask for an offering. Well, I don't know why I got to ask for that. Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm not going to do that. And I don't know. I'm, I'm, gonna free no, I'm not going to give no free will offering. I'm not going to give all my we, I paycheck and then I got an increase. I'm not, and I'm not going to give my tithes enough. No, I'm, but when Abraham was asked to offer, to give an offering to God, when Abraham was asked to give an offering to God, when Abraham was asked to give an offering, he didn't change words. He didn't argue it. He said, let's go, Isaac. When Isaac realized he was the offering, when Isaac realized he was the offering, he didn't change words. He didn't change words. And so you can say to your stinking flesh and family members, you know, this is what I have belongs to the Lord. What you can do, however, you can tell your family members that they're stinking flesh. They stink to hell with the NAACP and their Black Lives Matter and their Black Obama, their Black this, or your MAGA people with their MAGA this and all their lying about the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're going to be raptured up. You can tell them stinking MAGA people and everybody else, some Catholics as well. You can tell them all. You know what you can do? You can, you, if, you, if, you, if you're lucky, if you're blessed, I shouldn't say lucky, if you're blessed, get on your knees and maybe God will call you to be one of the chosen to go up on the mount. Otherwise, otherwise everything I have is for Jesus. Just like Peter. That, that is a powerful, that's a powerful example. I think even more powerful than Abraham. You have to think well, Abraham had to endure some stuff. First, God tells him that his children, even before Isaac is born, God tells him, when you do have children, they're going to be slaves for 400 years. <laughs> Come on. He tells him, it's in Genesis chapter 15, he tells him, even before Isaac is born, he said, your children are going to be slaves for 400 years. And then he tells him, once you have a son, I want you to cut his throat, sacrifice him on the altar for me. I was thinking a message I taught this past Sabbath regarding the second slaves, the second prophecy, the second prophecy led. And I was listening to myself preach that. There are two things. One is, is that the, uh, no one else can preach that. They, nobody can preach that because you don't know anybody that's going to admit that it was a blessing to be a slave. Black people, you know, so it ain't no way anybody else going to ever preach that unless God chooses them to do it. But right now, they're not going to just get up in their church and start and say, it was a blessing for black people to have been a slave. And they should have paid attention to what the Japheth, who's a white man, and the Jewish man, Shemite, they should have paid attention. They should stop cussing them out. They should thank him that they brought him out of, the, out of Africa, out of the Congo, out of the, out of the dark recesses of Africa, out of the jungles of Africa and brought them to the, to the land of the light. They should thank the white man for bringing them here. You ain't gonna find nobody. <laughs> you ain't gonna find that preached. But the other thing is this, is that Abraham had to endure that, and he did. God told him, 
that your children are going to be slaves. But after that, they're going to be a mighty and a great people. I'm going to give them a promised land. It's going to be a holy land. And Abraham endured that. He didn't change words. He didn't argue with God. And so this is all Bible. It's just all Bible. It's just all Bible, my friends. It's, it's just the truth. And so I pray that what God will do, that he'll help us understand the demarcation between the call, the nine that were left in the valley, and the three that went up on the mount. That we'll clearly understand that not everybody is chosen. And God even knew, like some of you are chosen, but you didn't know you were chosen. God knew the chosen before they knew that they were chosen to go up on the mount. But once chosen, everything has to be sacrificed. Quickly, Miss Engineer, let me go back to Matthew 17 because my time is running out. What I want to say to you is that if you're not chosen, you can't hear. If you're not chosen, even God Almighty has forbidden you. God has locked it where you can't hear. You will not. I don't care if I preach this sermon from the top of the World Trade Center. You won't hear it. I don't care if I preach it from BET or CNN. You st if you're not chosen, you will not hear Atla. And while he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my love, beloved son, in which I am well pleased. And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and said they were so afraid. And Jesus said unto them, Arise and be not afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no man. And when they hear, here's a segment of the, this is the demarcation between the chosen and the called. And as they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them, don't tell anybody. Don't tell the nine. Don't tell. So why, why? They're part of the group. I said, don't tell them. Don't tell the nine. Don't tell them. Don't tell them or anybody else. Don't tell your mama. Don't tell your daddy. Don't tell Thomas. Don't tell Matthew. Don't tell them. They're not chosen. They call, but they're not. Don't tell them. That's what. And if. if you, so, you, so God has forbidden, if you're not chosen, God has forbidden you to know. If you're not chosen, God has forbidden you to know. And here's, the, here's the, the, where we're going to pick up next time you and I get together, and that is this. You will hold this information secret until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. And the reason why you're getting this teaching now is that the Son of Man is coming back to planet Earth again. And that's why this teaching is being released. That's why it wasn't released a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. It's being released now. Now you can get the information, but you got to wait till the Son of Man be risen from the dead. That's what he told. Don't tell them now. Don't tell them now. Don't tell them now. You will know. You will know where your heart is. Is your heart with Atla, the place where Jesus will come, or is your heart with your family members, and your possession, pinching off a piece of money every week for them? You're no good stinking flesh. You're stinking sons and daughters. You just keep piecing off. And the other thing is many of y'all are scared that if you don't pinch off something for that dog you call your son or that dog you call your daughter or that swine you call your relative, if you don't pinch off something for them, they will kill you. They'll stick a knife in your car, in the, in the tires of your car. They will kill you. That flesh. So really, it isn't just a matter that you're disobedient. They are so wicked. Them dogs that you're giving money to, them dogs that you're giving property to, them dogs will kill you. They will bite you. They will bite you. Them dogs. Them swine will turn again and rend you. If, if you say, I'm stopping, I'm cutting you off, I'm sacrificing everything I have for Jesus and Atla and a place for Jesus to sleep when he return, they will come after you. Your own son will come after you. Yes, he will. <laughs> yes, he will. Or yes, she will. Or yes, they will. They will come after you. <laughs> Ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? For Almighty God. Many are called, but few are chosen.